Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about environmental challenges and climate change with guests Jad Daly, President and CEO of American Forests, Bob Irvin, President of American Rivers, and Mark Spaulding, President of the Ocean Foundation. It's great to have you all here. We have been living through this amazing time in which uh, we are experiencing fires across the West. If you just take a look at the map across the West, it is just stunning. And in our area, we've had uh, four successive years of historic uh, uh, fires uh, here in Northern California. Uh, We are experiencing flooding. We are experiencing hurricanes. Uh, We are seeing um, the the impact on biodiversity and and species. we would like to really tap into your expertise. We're gonna start with Jad because of the dramatic fires that we've all seen, whether it's in Australia or across the American West. And just let's sort of take stock of what is going on right now in this country and in the world that attaches to um, our behaviors and and climate change. Jad? Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. And and let me just add a a very friendly amendment to that long list of challenges we're facing from climate change, which is extreme heat, right? We had uh, recent temperatures in, uh, not just in Death Valley, um, but in, uh, you know, the Los Angeles Basin of over 120 degrees. Um, So we have uh, an incredible challenge to bring equitable heat resilience uh, to uh, communities across America and around the world as well, uh, dealing with all those other uh, challenges that you just mentioned. And and look, tr- trees and forests have a huge role to play um, in helping us both slow climate change and also build resilience to it for our communities. Uh, we actually like to think that trees and forests hold the swing vote uh, on, on climate change. You know, here in the United States right now, um, our trees and our forests and our forest products uh, capture uh, carbon dioxide equivalent to about 15% of our carbon emissions from fossil fuels. A lot of times people say, hey, we need to make forests a climate change solution. They already are. They're delivering huge climate change solutions uh, for us right now in the United States. Uh, And there's some great research. uh, The Nature Conservancy has done some leading research in this space, among others, that suggests that we could nearly double um, that uh, natural climate solution that we're getting from trees and forests and forest products um, if we make investments like planting uh, lots more trees and, and, and getting the management of forests uh, just right uh, in a changing climate. But, but here's the thing, the wildfires in the West have showed us that uh, uh, you know, that swing vote can go the other way too, that, that climate change is actually working against us as we're trying to use trees and forests as a solution by weakening them and ultimately in some cases uh, uh, killing and burning uh, uh, our trees and forests uh, you know, from the stresses of climate change. And so we like to think about it as carbon offense and carbon defense. And we need to take those actions that grow the capacity of forests to take in carbon dioxide, but we also need to take actions that actually make forests uh, healthy and resilient, even in the face of the kinds of climate stresses that we're seeing uh, in California. Um, so there's a lot more to say about that, and maybe we'll get into that as, as we go along, but I'll just leave with one capstone thought, uh, which is the urgency of this extreme heat crisis that we face in our communities uh, and the role that trees can play in shading our, our cities um, and bringing equitable heat resilience to communities. Because right now, a map of tree cover in virtually any city in America is also a map of income and even a map of race in ways that transcend income. Uh, and those tree inequities that we have in our communities lead to huge heat inequities uh, and air pollution inequities in our communities. Uh, so it's a real uh, environmental justice crisis, a climate justice crisis that ties to uh, tree cover uh, in our cities, which is why we're pushing for tree equity uh, in American cities as a way to really act on uh, bringing that, uh, that potential uh, and that protection uh, equitably to all neighborhoods uh, in our cities. And so it's, it's about those wildfire prone landscapes and what we need to do out there, but it's also about urban forests and how we equitably distribute urban forests in our communities um, to protect them from climate change. It's such an important point. We're going to come back to that because this whole idea of, of how that connects to, uh, to race and poverty and yeah. uh, discrepancies uh, based in income and other matters is, is really important. But you made another, another point which sort of leads into, into uh, Bob. Uh, trees sequester carbon. 
uh, trees sequester heat because it's absorbing that heat into, uh, into its being and converting it into energy and converting it into growth. Uh, uh, trees also are, uh, create the repository for, for waters. The soil um, uh, ends up binding together and is able to absorb water and then uh, give that to the rivers. And, and so the connection between the forests and the rivers is so manifest. Uh, Bob, what are you experiencing in your work um, as you're trying to improve uh, that part of this uh, holistic cycle that, and then feeds into Mark, uh, Mark's oceans, right? Yeah, exactly, Mark. I mean, you have really put together uh, a great panel today, and I'm so pleased to be here with Jad and, and Mark, uh, because the rivers, the forests, the oceans are all interdependent. And uh, so the work that each of us does in our respective spheres with our organization actually adds to the, the, the whole of, of making this a better planet. This year has been um, incredible on so many levels, apocalyptic uh, in many ways. And, but the, the, the silver lining of this is that I think it has really brought home for people the importance of protecting our rivers restoring our rivers, protecting and restoring our forests, and protecting our oceans. Um, when you look at the pandemic, one of the things that is absolutely clear is that we all need clean water. We need it to survive. We need it to wash our hands to protect ourselves from this deadly virus. And, uh, and so the pandemic has really brought that home. And it doesn't matter whether you are uh, a rich person, a poor person, a Democrat or a Republican, we all need clean water for life. And the source of clean water is healthy rivers. And so uh, my organization, American Rivers, is working very hard to protect the wild rivers that remain and to restore the damaged rivers that exist and to conserve clean water for people and nature all across this country. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is the impact of climate change. Uh, in, in our forests, on the ocean, and in our rivers. You know, those fires in the West uh, are burning intensely in these river uh, watersheds. And uh, we're going to see the impacts of these fires for years to come as a result of the erosion that's gonna occur. And, and so there's a lot of work to be done to restore um, our landscapes as a result of this as well as to prevent it. And, and what we're, we're seeing is that the impacts of climate change have become apparent to all of us now uh, because of these fires. And fortunately, one of the, the best ways to address those impacts is to actually have healthy river systems to, uh, to protect uh, the connectivity among rivers, to rivers provide the corridors where wildlife can move in response to the, the increased temperatures that result uh, from climate change. And, and also, you know, when we protect rivers and we protect and restore floodplains, we are providing a defense against the flooding that's occurring with uh, the extreme storms that we're seeing, you know, one tropical storm and hurricane after another, we're seeing this this year as well in the other part of the country in the east. And um, when we protect and restore rivers, we provide a defense against that flooding. And, uh, and at the same time, we also provide uh, natural reservoirs uh, to deal with the impacts of increased drought, which we're seeing as a result of climate change as well. So I think that, that as bad as things are, uh, you know, it's not too late. We actually can take action to uh, address climate change, the causes of it and the impacts of it. And uh, all three of us in, in the worlds that we work in uh, are making a contribution in that regard. And so w w when you look at the, the, uh, the map of how water moves, right? You've got water coming in and we've all seen it, right? We saw when we were little kids, right? The clouds come over and they go over the land and then the, the, the rain comes down and we get fresh water into the rivers. Those go into the aquifers, right? And then they flow out into the oceans. And then you have all these ecosystems where the fresh water meets the seawater and the, the, the oceans are constantly replenished and, and that whole cycle goes, goes on and on. 
Uh, Mark, when, when you're looking at, at the oceans and this sort of massive, massive re reservoir of Earth's life, how are you seeing the impacts affecting you? We've heard uh, from the forests, we've heard from the rivers. Um, how do you see this affecting the oceans? Because we look at the ocean, the ocean looks like it did five years ago, right? It looks like, like it did five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but it's not the same ocean, is it? It's definitely not, and that's exactly the problem. Uh, but if you do have a drink on your back porch overlooking the ocean, it doesn't look any different whether it's dead or alive. And that is part of our challenge is it's a little more unseen than what uh, Jad or, or Bob face. So we are constantly thinking about this problem. The same heat that Jad mentioned is happening to the ocean and the sh extreme heat events are bleaching the corals. The same uh, pollution that is causing climate change in general is also depositing carbon into the ocean, changing the literal chemistry of the ocean. The ocean is becoming more acidic. And this is going to literally take your breath away. The acidity of the ocean will attack the critters that produce oxygen, the plants that produce oxygen in the ocean, which provides somewhere between a third and a half of every breath you take. And so we have a, a crisis that is uh, hard to imagine, given the scale of the ocean and the scale that it of energy that it took to change its temperature, change its chemistry. And so we are seeing these, you know, increasingly powerful storms. Maybe we're not necessarily seeing more storms because of climate change, but we're seeing that they're moving more slowly, packing more punch, uh, uh, and perhaps even taking tracks that are a little different than, than we've seen in the past, thus exposing more and more of us to, to harm. And, you know, we are a, a people who like living near the ocean, right? 50% of us around the world live near the ocean. Therefore, we're putting ourselves in harm's way from sea level rise, the storms, etc. A study that just came out said we can restore the ocean. We can restore it within 30 years if we do things right. We also know that it is the nature-based uh, solutions at the shoreline that can really save our human settlements, whether it be seagrass meadows, mangroves, uh, salt marsh estuaries, which connects us right back to, to Bob and the rivers. Um, those things slow storm surge. They attenuate the height of waves, and those things protect us. And so if we can restore those and protect the ocean we can do something. Those same seagrass meadows also take up carbon. They function just like Jad's forests, and therefore they are taking carbon literally out of the water column and helping us address the chemistry change, the acidification of the ocean at the same time. So while there is a massive scale of change of the ocean, which is so big and so unimaginable to be changed, there is also hope and opportunity to do something. You point to things that we can do. Carlos de la Rosa um, of Lindsay Wildlife was asking, what can we all do? You pointed to some of those, uh, replanting seagrasses and, and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, we just finished a, a uh, poll in which we asked kind of a, a combined question as one of our viewers uh, pointed out. Um, the, the, first, the first part of the question was, do humans negatively impact uh, the climate? And um, um, are we willing to uh, address that through significant expense, increases in taxes and so on and so forth? And 95% uh, of the people said yes, no one said no. Um, so we actually have to take action, right? So we know this. We don't have to talk about whether there's a problem anymore. And uh, Mark, uh, mentioned a number of actions that can be taken for the ocean. And I love the calculation that you posed, Mark. You said that the oceans provide how much percentage of our oxygen on a renewable basis? Up to 50%. So if acidification were to reduce that by 1% or 2% in five years or in 10 years, 
or 3%. The math is there for us, right? Exactly. If we can, if we can do, if we can figure out how to tally up uh, to split uh, tips on a, on, a, on, a, on a restaurant bill, uh, we can figure out that math, right? Absolutely right. And you can imagine those people who are advised against being in places at high altitude with low oxygen will have less and less part of the planet they can live on. So, uh, John, when, when, when we take uh, some of uh, Mark's points about what we can do individually and collectively uh, in the ocean, uh, to help the oceans, on the forest side, um, is, the, um, is the solution to replant forests as they were? Is, is the solution to manage forests differently? Do we have to recover uh, habitat? Are there priorities that we need to address um, in the forest side? And then we're gonna, uh, Bob, we're gonna get to you as well, because uh, I know you have a whole list, right? That's, that's your organization. Um, but Jad, could you just sort of talk about what we can do as individuals and collectively? Yeah, and I'm looking for the all of the above box on that great uh, multiple <laughs> choice that you just provided, because it really is um, all, all of the above. And I wanna, I want to touch on a couple of things. I really appreciated the chat question about what, what can individuals do? Because I think sometimes we talk about what do we need governments to do? What can you know, organizations like ours do? What can companies do? But um, this is an all hands on deck uh, situation that we're in right now with climate change. And I think one of the things I'm most excited about uh, with trees and forests is that people can have, ha individuals can touch into the range of actions that we need to take. And in particular, I'll start with the first one you mentioned, planting more trees. Um, you know, we're just seeing this incredible excitement around uh, the United States and around the world around the tree planting movement. And the fact that um, whether it's our organization and with working with partners like the, the United States Forest Service and, and, and companies like Salesforce uh, to do very large scale ecosystem restoration uh, level uh, tree planting projects on some of these areas uh, that had been burned in California previously, as a matter of fact. Um, that's been a major area of activity for us in these amazing, par amazing kind of three-way partnerships with governments and, and companies that really are leaning into to the challenge of, of reforestation, um, as well as I should note also uh, partnering on planting tree equity in cities as well. City governments, companies, and nonprofit organizations, community groups have been forming these really powerful partnerships to do big projects at scale, uh, bringing the benefits of trees and forests to the landscape. Um, but, uh, you know, we're equally excited about this dispersed uh, activity. Uh, you know, Girl Scouts of the USA, uh, you know, is a partner um, and, and other youth organizations. You've got faith organizations. Uh, we're working with a group called EcoSeek, which is concerned Seeks around the world, planting forests. Uh, uh, to act on climate change and other other friends places. of the urban forests, right? I mean, all these different nonprofits, um, uh, uh, organizations that are trying to uh, deal with inner city issues, right? This whole idea of shade in the cities, which you brought up, right? And you've got you've got organizations that would normally be associated with advocacy on race and poverty and so on that are that are just taking these these ideas and moving forward with them. Yeah, and so I don't take all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll just run with exactly that point, uh, you know, that, that uh, the way we used to define the forest community and success if we could get forest landowners and, and forest products companies and, and governments and nonprofits like American Forests uh, work, all working together. And what we've fundamentally done is redefine the forest community because all the different kinds of folks we're talking about who aren't foresters are seeing that they can use trees and forests to address the, the things they care about, whether it's health equity and climate justice in cities, uh, you know, or, or whether it, you know, it's acting on climate change or whether it's uh, caring for our rivers and our drinking water. I mean, just across the board, whatever you, whatever you care about, trees and forests can play a role in getting that right. Um, and so that just makes our community of interest much broader, I think, than we, we used to think of it. So I'm really proud to say that back on uh, August 27th, uh, we launched a, a new U.S. chapter of the Global Trillion Trees platform, 1T.org. 1T.org was launched to say, hey, everyone around the world has gotten uh, excited about this vision. If, if we could uh, conserve, restore, and grow a trillion more trees by 2030, think of the scale of benefit that that could deliver out um, from city streets to large natural landscapes. And so 
there was so much excitement here in the United States, again, from youth groups and faith groups to the federal government and everyone in between, um, that we said, well, this can't be a forestry thing. This has to be an America thing. And so we launched this U.S. chapter uh, you know, with 29 pledges, almost a billion trees that were pledged uh, by all those different actors, uh, city governments, uh, companies of all kinds, not just forestry companies, but technology companies, uh, folks from the finance uh, uh, sector and others stepping up um, to plant, uh, to, to a pledge, uh, you know, millions and millions of trees to be uh, uh, conserved and restored and grown. And then these amazing supporting actions in technology and workforce development and uh, carbon finance strategies and other things, which will ultimately lead to billions and billions more trees uh, in the future. Um, and, and so, the, you know, with the, the, the upshot on it is, is that we've now got here in the United States, a forest movement uh, with a tent big enough for everyone, all the way down to individuals uh, who want to come in and plug into this work, plant their one tree, in, or, or get involved with work in their communities, because the way we're going to plant a trillion trees is one tree at a time. Um, and so no contribution is too small. And I think we've now created a platform where everyone can find their place in this movement and everyone can contribute. I'd like to get to Bob. Bob, we, we had an interview about eight years ago. So we, uh, you and I have the advantage here of being able to look at eight years ago and look at what you're doing with American Rivers now, right? Could you just describe um, that sort of arc and uh, the programs that you have in place now to help restore, protect, extend the rivers um, in, 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 in your area? Sure. Which is sort of the intersection between trees and oceans, right? Yeah. Well, American Rivers has been around for 47 years, and we, uh, you know, we we have uh, uh, grown our our focus and mission over all those years. But we still do a lot of the same things that we started with. You know, we we work to protect wild rivers. So if there's a proposal to build new dams. Uh, you know, we in all likelihood are going to oppose that because we have way too many dams, uh, many of which are obsolete and unsafe now. So we work to take to restore rivers by taking out those obsolete and unsafe dams. But we also work with the hydropower industry to change the way the dams that remain are operated so that they can as closely as possible replicate the natural flow of the river and minimize the, the harm. To, to that. Uh, we work to protect wild and scenic rivers. That's been, we've done that from the start. But the area where I think we've really grown and changed over the years is we really work now with communities all across the country and in particular with communities of color to conserve clean water uh, by, by working to, to protect uh, the sources of water to make sure that everyone has access to clean water in their communities and to engage the members of those communities in actually deciding what's the best approach, what needs to be done in, in their communities, because those communities of color are disproportionately affected by pollution, by a lack of access to clean water. So that's been the biggest change uh, that we've done. In and the Flint, the Flint situation was kind of a dual hit, right? It was the neglect and, and the, the cavalier attitude but also because that river was so polluted, right? Well, it, it actually wasn't the river's pollution. It was the fact that it had a different chemistry. And when they switched the water supply to the Flint River, they didn't take that into account. And it, it caused the lead and, uh, and other materials in the pipes to leach into the drinking water. And that, that was the real problem there. But you know, that situation and all of these situations highlight for me what I often get asked, what's the most important thing that an individual can do for rivers? Mm -hmm. And my answer is always the same. The most important thing that anyone can do is to vote. We are a nonpartisan organization. We won't tell you how to vote, but if you care about rivers, if you care about forests, if you care about the oceans, go to the polls and vote for the candidates who reflect the views that you have on those issues. It is our right and our responsibility as Americans to do that. Um, we just finished a, uh, a poll in which um, the preponderance of answers uh, alighted on two different priorities. One uh, for the environment, one is reduction in greenhouse gases, and the other is stopping habitat loss and repair damage to loss uh, habitat. I'd like to uh, raise a question that was also raised by uh, participant uh, Mike, uh, Michael Sutton 
about the whole question of information and disinformation, particularly when it comes to science. Bob, you were, and, and we'll start with you, you were, you were uh, pointing to the idea that uh, science really needs to guide uh, votes because of paying attention to science, and Mark made the same um, point, paying attention to science means that you have clear uh, action that can be taken to improve the world. Um, how do you see the whole question of information, disinformation, uh, when it comes to affecting your activities, your investments also in staff, and, and uh, how you use time during the day? Well, we have to uh, have a, a strong basis in science for everything we do, and we have to operate in a world of facts. And there has been a very active and widespread campaign in this country by certain interests to undermine our, our, our faith in facts and our faith in science. But boy, if anything has brought home the, the need to listen to the science and, and, and to follow it, this pandemic has brought that home uh, because our failure to do that is why the country is in the mess that it's in. And the only way we're going to get out of it is to listen to the scientists, take the actions that we need to do, uh, and, and that will get us uh, to a point where we can return to uh, some sense of normalcy. Um, and so for an organization like American Rivers, we pride ourselves in, on operating on the basis of sound science. Every year we do America's most endangered rivers list, the top 10 rivers that are, that are threatened or endangered. And when we put that list together, we look at what is the science telling us about these rivers uh, that, are, that are under threat and what needs to be done to alleviate that threat. And Mark, do we have to become um, is communications experts in a way that in the, in previously, because of this sort of uh, undermining of science, is it now incumbent upon you? I mean, you're the Ocean Foundation. You're not the communication and media, you know, advocacy organization, but it seems that just talking about fact is, is, is politics now, right? Absolutely right. I mean, we have always thought that, you know, if people only understood forests or only understood rivers or only stood oceans, they would change their behavior. But knowledge is not sufficient, right? I know that I should exercise and eat less. People who smoke, many of them know they ought not to smoke. But that doesn't, that knowledge is not sufficient. We actually have to figure out communication strategies that will entice people to make behavioral change. Um, we can sit back in one way and rely on the science to speak for itself, right? People, we don't have to say you must believe in climate change or you must believe in uh, the, the, the pandemic's virus. Um, it is, it just is. There is no belief system that's necessary there. But what we have to do is get across what needs to change, right? And so we've spent a lot of time looking at behavioral change uh, studies to begin to think about how to communicate that and what resonates with people, what kind of rebuilding after this pandemic will build back better, which will be more equitable, which will be better for the ocean, which will be better for the coasts, the forests, and the rivers. How do we make all of this, this work? Um, you know, Mike Sutton's question, and, and hello, Mike, he's an old friend of mine, um, this is how we combat misinformation from the top, is with science, with the science coming forward, and with a communication strategy that makes a difference. But that means we in the conservation community need to learn how to do that. It seems to me that, that even that isn't enough. Um, and what we're trying to do with this program is to inform, right, to, to basically engage people. But uh, one of the things that, that I'm struggling with is that we have to get beyond, as you say, beyond information into action. So how do we use this program? How do we use your interactions with your communities to make it easy for somebody to actually do something, to actually change a behavior, participate in something? Mark, do you have uh, programs like this where, um, where you can engage a broader public in your, in your work? I, and, I, and I know you probably have sort of a click to donate kind of a thing, you know, those kinds of kinds of things. But is there anything else in, in the way that you see the politicians do, right? Instead of being political, you know, cl 
clean up something that helps the oceans, right? You know, that kind of thing. Do you do any of that? So we are a philanthropy, so we support many, many other organizations that do that kind of work. But what we do offer is an offset, right? We have seagrassgrow.org, which allows someone to calculate their own carbon footprint, their households or their travel, and donate enough money to actually plant seagrass mangroves and restore uh, estuaries to take up and store carbon. Oh, that's and, great. And, and that is, is one methodology. We also spend a lot of time working with financial investors to put money behind solutions. Uh, companies that have a product or service that is actively good for the ocean, putting money behind those, whether it's a private equity, uh, new technology under uh, that's emerging, or whether it's uh, companies that already exist. And we just launched a week ago a new uh, ocean engagement fund uh, with Credit Suisse and, and Rockefeller Asset Management to invest in companies that are bad for the ocean and then engage their, their leadership and talk to them about how they can make change and giving them solutions that they can apply as companies that will change the harm they're doing to the ocean. And individuals can invest in any of these, these funds and put money behind the voices that we're putting in front of these companies. That's well, just a wonderful this point too. I, I can just offer a quick thought on, um, on this engagement question because I want to come back to, to something I said before. I mean, I think one of the things I'm so excited about whether it's the tree equity movement in cities or whether this work happening in rural communities in the forest space, that there is a many hands make light work situation and there are opportunities for people to volunteer and get directly involved um, in, in some of the projects that are, that are happening. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, there are both opportunities on our website for people to get guidance on everything from how to plant a tree on your own property to uh, learning about different projects that we're involved in. But, uh, and so that's, and so I, I, you know, be excited if folks wanted to check that out. But I also just really want to encourage folks to, to look into the community-based organizations right in your own backyard. Um, you know, I think national organizations like ours play a, a really critical role, but we do our best work when we're in partnership with frontline organizations and, and some things Bob said earlier, diverse organizations that represent the incredible uh, diversity of people who are doing amazing work in this space. Often those community-based organizations don't get the same level of support and resources. Um, and so uh, just really encourage folks to, to look at the group that might be right in your own backyard that you haven't noticed that it could use your hands, it could use your donations, could use your voice um, you know, for some of the work that's happening uh, in, in your community and, um, and, and to really be creative and looking for who some of those kinds of leaders are, are where you live. And Bob, let's let, let's give you the capper. Um, talk a little bit about how you're you're taking your communication strategy and helping people to to make those small actions that can have a large effect when done collectively. Well, sure. We at American Rivers we sponsor the National River Cleanup, which is the umbrella organization for local river cleanups all over the country. And so you can go to our website, AmericanRivers.org, and learn more about that and how to connect with cleanups wherever you live in the country. You can also become an activist, uh, take action, learn about issues both regionally and at the national level. Uh, we'll be happy to, to uh, send you emails and newsletters to inform you of that and alerts when, when it's an appropriate time to take action with your elected officials. Uh, and to just learn more about uh, the, the rivers uh, and the issues around the country and in your backyard. Such a great point to, to go off of. What makes an activist? Acting. Let's act. Small things, large things. Let's be activists. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, coming in and sharing your experience with us and the work of your wonderful organizations, Chad Daly, of the American Forest, Bob Irwin of, uh, of American Rivers, and Mark Spaulding of the Ocean Foundation. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. That's the nonprofit report. Of